the graphical desktop of the Unix and Linux operating systems has turned 40. Today on Al's Geek Lab, we explore the history of the X Windows system, commonly known today as X11. From its inception to its modern day rivalry with Wayland, buckle up as we explore the highs, the lows and the quirks of this enduring piece of technology that has shaped the graphical landscape of Unix-like operating systems for decades. This video is sponsored by the very wonderful people at PCBWay. PCBWay are the leading electronics and prototyping manufacturer. If you've got an idea, you can use PCBWay to turn it into a reality. PCBWay can build PCBs from just $5 and build them for you in around 24 hours. PCBWay also do 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, injection molding and so much more. So if you've got an idea for an electronics project, why don't you give PCBWay a try at PCBWay.com. After all, that is the PCBWay. We thank PCBWay for sponsoring Al's Geek Lab. Now, let's get back to the video. The Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC, had created a standardized graphical desktop environment as early as 1973 and released a graphical desktop computer to the market, first with the Alto computer and then the Star in 1981. Our story begins in January of 1983 though, where Apple Computer had copied many of the features of the Xerox Star and released their Lisa computer. The Lisa sported a black and white bitmap graphical user interface. Like the Xerox systems before it, the Lisa was not commercially successful. However, it was at least the first time that the mass market had a glimpse of a graphical desktop operating system. Terms such as Windows, icons, menus and the mouse pointer that we take for granted today were paraded by Steve Jobs as the new revolution in computing. The year later, Lisa's cheaper sibling, the Macintosh, would be released and we all know what happened from then on. Around the same time, two students, Brian Reed and Paul Ascenti, over at Stanford University had created a video frame buffer kernel and rudimentary operating system called the V-Kernel. On top of V, they built a graphical windowing system called W. The whole system operated through remote procedure calls, or RPCs. This was different from what was coming out at the same time from the likes of Apple, whereas on a Lisa or a Macintosh, the whole kernel, operating system and graphical system operated as one self-contained unit. Everything operated on one computer that sat on your desk. With the V and W systems, they could operate in a distributed fashion. Literally, you could have the V system running your application using the processing power of a mainframe in a separate building or even a separate town via a remote link, whilst the W system could show you the application output, including your graphics. This was likely running on a lower powered workstation on your desk. It was possible to run both V and W on the same system, but back in 1984, heavy processing power and memory was very expensive, and poor students, such as Reed and Ascenti, would have seen this as the logical option, given that at a university campus, most tasks would operate in a distributed, time-shared, multi-user basis. A short while later, V and W were ported to run on the digital VAC station 100, a new but well-revered system at the time in universities. Around the same time, over on the east coast of the USA at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Bob Scheifler and Jim Gettys got wind of the W platform. Although V and W were proprietary, it was pretty common for universities to share code at the time, and so Bob Scheifler at MIT got his hands on V and W and started to hack away at the code for W because on the applications that he was working on, he wanted to be able to have multiple windows available on the screen at the same time, debugging on separate threads. Today, we take this multi-window, multi-process, multi-threaded capability for granted, but in 1984, it was absolutely state of the art. 
At MIT, Bob wasn't using the digital VMS operating system which W was developed for, he was using Unix. Unix had been invented at MIT in cooperation with AT&T, so it made sense to hack W to work on Unix. And because Unix ends with the letter X, and because the letter X is after W, Scheifler's implementation of the W graphical system for Unix was known as X. Pretty original stuff, eh? One advantage that Unix had over the V operating system was that it allowed asynchronous tasks. So rather than handling one task at a time, X was a true multitasking graphical system. The first version of the X window system was released in 1984, and it laid the groundwork for what was to come. However, it was version 11, known as X11, released in 1987, that became the definitive version, solidifying its place in history. X11 quickly became the backbone of graphical environments for Unix systems. It was praised for its network transparency, allowing users to run applications on remote machines and displaying them locally. Imagine the surprise when someone in the 80s found that they could run the graphical word processor, games and spreadsheets on a fairly low-powered Unix workstation from a hefty server in another room. Over the years, various forks of X11 have occurred, all with slightly different goals. The popular ones being X386 in the late 1990s and early noughties, then Xorg, which is the popular variant on most Linux desktops to this day. But like any technology, X11 has had its share of quirks and issues along the way. One notable challenge was its complexity, both on the back end and on the front end. Configuring X11, for example, could sometimes feel like solving a Rubik's Cube blindfolded. Despite its complexities, X11's design was incredibly forward-thinking. Its client-server model separated the application logic from the display logic, a concept that remains relevant in today's computing world. This separation allowed for great flexibility, but also led to performance bottlenecks, especially as GUIs became ever more sophisticated. X11's architecture was revolutionary, but as graphical requirements grew, the performance issues became more pronounced. The system wasn't originally designed with GPUs, modern fonts, 3D gaming and rendering in mind. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate your continued feedback. We also have a Patreon site, which has some exclusive content as well as early access to all our videos. If you'd like to check it out, then head over to patreon.com forward slash Lab. Let's fast forward to the late 2000s and the need for a more efficient and streamlined system. This led to the birth of Wayland. Created by Christian Hogsberg in 2008, Wayland aimed to address the shortcomings of X11 by simplifying the graphical stack and leveraging modern hardware capabilities. With Wayland, the intention was to move the X server and all its legacy technology to an optional code path. Wayland was designed to be more efficient by removing the need for a separate compositor. This led to reduced latency and better performance for modern applications. However, the transition hasn't always been entirely smooth. Whilst Wayland offers significant performance improvements, its adoption has been gradual. X11's long history means that a vast number of applications and systems still rely on that X11 subsystem. Compatibility and feature completeness have been hurdles for Wayland, and many users still find themselves using X11 for certain tasks. Indeed, many Linux distributions ship with Wayland these days, and many users love the speed of Wayland. But there are times that users need to fall back on X11. It's like having a reliable old car. It might not be the fastest, but it certainly gets the job done. The competition between X11 and Wayland continues to this day, with both systems evolving to meet the needs of modern users. X11 has seen updates and improvements to address some of its performance issues, while Wayland continues to expand its compatibility and feature set. These days, X11 can run inside Wayland using X Wayland, 
this solution makes for generally high compatibility, albeit with a small performance overhead. There are still some compatibility issues with X11 specific applications that will simply not operate or be buggy at least. Furthermore, if you're a fan of using X11 to render applications remotely, as per the original design intention of X and even W before it, you'll be disappointed to hear that Wayland does not support network transparency or remote rendering directly. This was deliberate to favour simplicity over features. The debate between X11 and Wayland enthusiasts can get quite lively at times. Some swear by the stability and maturity of X11, while others champion the modern, efficient design of Wayland. It's a classic case of the old guard versus the new guard, but in the end, both systems have their merits. So, what does the future hold? With ongoing development, both X11 and Wayland are set to coexist for the foreseeable future, whether it's the venerable X11 still adapting and involving, or the sleek and modern Wayland, the choice ultimately depends on your specific needs and preferences. The journey of X11 and the rise of Wayland exemplify the dynamic nature of technology. It's not just about what's better, it's about what fits the context of use. Both have contributed immensely to the evolution of graphical interfaces. Thank you for joining us on this historical tour of the X window system. As technology advances, so too will the tools that we use. But let's not forget the giants on the shoulders we stand. Don't forget to press that notification bell after subscribing to get more videos like this. I'd like to also thank our Patreon supporters that you can see scrolling by on the screen here for continuing to help this channel thrive. If you'd like to help out, head on over to patreon.com forward slash alsgeeklab where you get some extra exclusive content as well as early access to our videos. Until next time, thanks for watching and be excellent to each other.